Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Spark's first ever webinar. So uh, today is the martyrdom uh, day of Shankar Guhan Yogi. And Comrade Shankar is a legendary trade unionist whose work with peasants and workers alike continue to inspire our workers' movement. On this occasion, I'd like to thank Sudha Ma'am for speaking with us about Comrade Shankar. Popularly known as the People's Lawyer, Sudha Ma'am is an inspiring trade unionist and an activist. She spent decades working with working among historically oppressed Adivasi communities in the state of Chhattisgarh. On behalf of the entire Spark team, thank you once again, Ma'am, for taking time out to speak with us. Uh, Spark, since its inception in January, Spark has uh, Spark is a student youth run Bangalore based magazine. And uh, we have consistently released a new issue every month. Our dedicated editorial team is comprised of students from various campuses in Bangalore, such as IISC, IIA, MCC, APU, Christ, etc. And uh, we strive to challenge the existing status quo with our words in every issue. We work tirelessly day and night to ignite class, conscious, class consciousness among the largely apolitical student community in Bangalore. Operating solely on crowdfunding, we managed to sustain our operations in a highly subsidized manner. Therefore, I request everyone here present in the meeting to contribute to our funds and enable us to continue delivering our magazine every month. Having said that, I'd like to hand over to my co-host Devjani for moderating the meeting. Thank you, Sri Lakshmi. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, Comrade. Uh, we have gathered here this evening for an interactive session with Comrade Sudha, and we largely look forward to learn about the life and times of Comrade Shankar Bhuaniyogi, uh, the trade union movement in Chhattisgarh uh, under the banner of the Chhattisgarh Mines from Sangh, the CMSS, and the Chhattisgarh Mukti Morcha, the CMM. And the various other facets of uh, what prompts the question on um, what we can do today to bring about a unified struggle of students, peasants, and the working class. Um, sadly, it raises no eyebrows when we say that the windows for civil liberty in this country has sunk, shrunk in the contemporary times. The common man today has been grappling with the evils of communalism, increasing instances of caste violence, unemployment, and attack on the uh, fundamental rights and civil liberties, including the right of human life and dignified living. This is why we intend this webinar to be a reflection of how there is singing in the dark times and also singing about the dark times. We are glad to have you here with us, uh, Comrade Sudha. Um, since uh, the 28th of September this year, mark the 32nd martyrdom of um, Comrade Shankar Guhan Yogi. Let us begin the talk by asking you about the life and times of Comrade Shankar Guhan Yogi. Uh, Ma'am, could you please elaborate, uh, please reflect and tell us about the life and times of Comrade Shankar Guhan Yogi and the Chhattisgarh Mukti Mocha and the entire trade union movement basically in Chhattisgarh. Um, good evening, all of you. Uh, thank you very much, Devjani, uh, Aritrika, and all other people who are behind uh, Sri and all others of you who are behind this, uh, organizing this webinar. <clears throat> Actually, uh, it's so pleasant to be talking to people of your generation who are interested in these questions. Um, actually, you know, I suppose, I mean, if, if you're in your uh, 20s, uh, you have hardly seen big trade union movements. I mean, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, if, if the, I think the nearest to that would have been the Maruti movement, if you people have been following from 2012 onwards, the Maruti movement. And even there, you have seen that when permanent workers and contract workers try to get together, even to simply unionize, how much repression is unleashed upon them. And uh, you know, time after time, their union leaders are harassed, victimized, and finally, the whole thing becomes a law and order situation. There is a case filed against hundreds of workers, and some of them have now, the leaders have come out after 10 to 12 years of being in jail. So how tough a trade union struggle is, and you have witnessed to, during the lockdown, uh, 
you know, the crores of people who simply began walking after one week because they they could not survive more than one week in the places where, where they were working. They neither had a home nor a bank balance nor a, and, and they simply started walking home. Many of them died on the way. So that is the condition of the working class, which all of you are seeing. And um, so it's very difficult to imagine, uh, I'm sure for you, uh, uh, the trade union movements, which we have been lucky enough to see in our childhood, in our youth, uh, when we were your age. Um, I'm now uh, a senior citizen, so I am 61, soon to be 62. So uh, it was around your age that I actually joined the trade union movement. And I'm really so happy to know that uh, you people are eager to know about the trade union movement. Now, um, so the topic of our conversation today is Shankar Guhan Yogi and the Chhattisgarh labor movement. Um, uh, Niyogi, uh, I'll, I'll be very brief about it. Actually, there's, there is not much literature available about Shankar Guha Niyogi. The one uh, basic book which is there is called Sangharsh or Nirman. It is in Hindi. And uh, after seeing your interest, I really feel that I would like to begin translating that book into English because I'm sure many, many people who don't read uh, Hindi, don't understand Hindi would be really deprived of a very... Uh, interesting. So Sangarsh or Nirman is really the, the those of you who can uh, access it. It's available as an e-book. It was with the Raj Kamal Prakashan, but I think now they have stopped the reprints. Um, and um, so so that that is a, the, the basic source book in which you will find all his speeches and, uh, you know, about his life and about the movement and about the various comments of different people about his movement. Um, so Shankar Guha Niyogi uh, was born in 1942 on 18th of September. Um, he was just 48 when he was assassinated. The, the uh, enormity of what he was able to achieve in that very short life, he was just 48 uh, when he was killed, uh, is really something to be, I mean, seen to be believed. Of course, we must remember every person is a product of their times. So, you know, Shankar Guhan Yogi, I think, embodied all that was uh, uh, revolutionary in that, at that time in our country. And uh, he, he, so, um, so he, he belonged originally to Bengal, to Jalpaiguri, came from a middle-class kind of family. Uh, in his youth, he was associated with left kind of student movement uh, and, you know, uh, uh, he used to read a lot, run a library, and do all the things that you as youth are doing today. Run magazines, uh, run, a, you know, uh, um, and and it, he, I think he was about 19 or 20 when he uh, came to Chhattisgarh, to Bhilai, uh, to work as an apprentice in the Bhilai steel plant. He was just 19 or 20. And... Um, that was also the early beginning of the Bhilai steel plant itself. It was a public sector plant built with Russian support. Um, and uh, between 62 and 68, he worked there uh, in that plant. And it was while working there, he completed his BSc. He completed his, his uh, diploma in engineering. He, uh, he, he, was, he was an avid reader. He, he loved reading about science. He loved reading literature. He loved reading history. And... Um, and he was a born organizer. Uh, in his time, he, he worked in the coke oven of the, uh, of the Bilai steel plant. And he soon became an extremely popular person. And in those, those short years that he lived there, uh, he organized the one and the only strike which has ever happened in the Bilai steel plant, um, uh, in the coke oven. And uh, after that, there's never been uh, a strike. Uh, in the Bilai steel plant. And as you know, in a, in a steel plant, a strike is a very major thing because if there is a strike, then, you know, all that steel, uh, molten steel uh, will, you know, get uh, solidified and just getting a steel plant which has been in a strike back onto the wheels is a very tough job technologically. So uh, I don't think we have heard of many such strikes. But anyway, it was also a sign of the times. It was, it was a newly... Uh, a, a, a country which has emerged after a uh, fight against British imperialism and it was the early testing days 
um, it was also the time when the communist movement uh, in india was you know the, the there was a split in the cpm as you know the naxalwadi movement happened and uh, so it it was in this back backdrop that shankar guhan yogi emerged and uh, as as he he was always in in the uh, in the left politics left student politics and he also was closely associated and uh, was aware of the developments in the communist movement so uh, at the time when the cpm uh, split uh, and uh, a new party the cpi ml came onto the stage as it were uh, um, he also joined the uh, coordination of communist revolutionaries there was a there was a, a, a you know all the people who sort of came out of the cpm uh, thinking that uh, uh, that 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 a more uh, revolutionary politics is required um he was he was one of them and in 68 after uh, after the kokaban strike uh, he was thrown out of the bilai steel plant there were serious criminal cases on him including of, of course like now <laughs> of being a naxalite so uh, he and this is where his journey started becoming a little different um because he differed at that time from the um, from from the leadership of the newly uh, upcoming uh, cpiml in feeling that uh, all mass organization and all mass movement is necessarily reactionary so you know at that time the, the pendulum had swung absolutely the other way and there was a notion that you know oh, all these mass organizations are useless and mass movements are useless and basically there's nothing to be achieved from them and he strongly differed he felt that no we do need very vibrant mass movements mass organizations there is a possibility of having some kind of mass political consciousness and uh, this is what he uh, this is this is what he set out to achieve when in 68 he was thrown out of the bilai steel plant so virtually he went underground and in those periods until he sort of re-emerged in the dani tola mines uh, in the year uh, around uh, maybe 72 or so, um, he traveled around the entire rural South Chhattisgarh and went from place to place to place to place. I mean, they say ki he grazed goats, he sold banyans, he caught fish, he uh, lived in, you know, and he was, I think in that entire period before he became Shankar Guhan Yogi, he was arrested uh, four to five times. He was in the Jagdalpur jail, he was in several jails and he would go in and out and, you know, and he, but that was a time when he actually deeply integrated himself with the people of Chhattisgarh and began to understand the issues the, in the rural areas, the issues of the Adivasis, the issues. And um, eventually, um, and, and he, in fact, uh, participated in many big and small movements um, for, you know, build, uh, uh, building a pond, uh, you know, somewhere locally for, uh, you know, um, uh, opposing a dam. Uh, and he's actually, uh, at that time, that is the time he took on the name Shankar. His, his, his name uh, was actually Dhiresh Kumar, Dhiresh Kumar Guhan Yogi. And uh, though he was known in that period as Shankar Thakur, he then became went back to Shankar Guhan Yogi when he emerged as a trade union leader in 1977. So uh, then he went to the Dani Tola mines. Now these are the quartzite mines which are which are, uh, which are uh, 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 captive to the Bilai steel plant. And that is where uh, he was from 72 to 75 and uh, working as a worker and as a munshi and uh, uh, and integrating with the people in the mines, most of whom were Adivasi people. That is where he also met Asho or Asha Guhan Yogi, who became his wife. Um, and he completely, in fact, people did not even know that he knew English. So you can think of how he deeply integrated himself, that people did not even suspect that he knows English. Yeah, he was yeah, I, 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 bahut acha ladka hai, or bahut, uh, you know he's, he's a very nice young man and he, he can uh, he he knows his uh, knows how to do accounts and he knows how to uh, speak Hindi and all that and uh, again in 75 um, 
and with the emergency as usual people were picked up from all over he was again picked up uh, under indira gandhi's regime uh, under the misa maintenance of internal security and that is where uh, and he was released after the emergency was lifted now uh, in the meanwhile something was happening in delhi rajya so that something which happened was not something niyogi created it was something that the workers themselves created so at that time in delhi rajya uh, you had about 15000 contract workers in the mines the condition in the mines was appalling people were working 12 hours they were basically forced to work um, i mean uh, there are horror stories about how the contractors would drag in even women to work they they would be sexually exploited the uh, the uh, wages were not even 3 rupees a day i mean women were giving birth to children on the site of the mine uh, this was the kind of uh, condition it was all, absolutely terrible uh, they there were no uh, you know uh, uh, labor laws to speak of uh, for these miners and um, and the, the the workers the permanent workers who you know belong to somewhat different uh, class of workers as it were they had the permanent unions both of intac and of atac and the story starts with the contract labor going to the first they went en masse to the inter union and then to the etac union and demanded that they should also get bonus like everybody else so like they should get the same bonus which uh, the it, the permanent workers were getting and they were unceremoniously thrown out from that place uh, by both the unions and that is the time when they actually went and squatted in this lal maidan 15000 of them uh, for 56 days so it was an enormous revolt it was a revolt of really the lowest of the of the uh, of the, the contractual miners and they were sitting in that lal maidan and now the question was how to negotiate and who will negotiate and who will lead us and that is the time when they heard that there is this very honest and upright uh, young leader in danitola mines and he has just been released from jail so in fact uh he did not even get time to go home i mean he he was released from balo jail and he, uh, not balo i think uh, yes there was no balo jail at that time complete must have been dur or he had just reached home maybe after being released from jail and uh, uh, already his elder daughter kranti had been born um and uh, the workers arrived there and just picked him up and took him as their leader and uh, and and in the next few days they organized the chatisgarh mine shramik sang and uh, that is how the cmss was born and the uh, so actually that first upheaval was really by the workers themselves it was a very uh, um, sort of spontaneous thing but that is where then the leadership of shankar bhanuji came in which is what did he make of that union and um, it was a different union altogether it it was a union where um uh, where there was huge mass participation uh, there was a concept of mukhiyas system of mukhiyas 10 ke upar ek mukhiya so for every 10 workers there will be a mukhiya all decisions will be taken in a very democratic manner there were a lot of women because the the in the mines they would work in jodi husband and wife so one would be breaking the stones and the other would be carrying the stones so uh, carrying the iron ore and it was it was a manual process so um, so so a lot of women uh, were there and this was the culture of the union to get everybody to participate and um, and right from the start uh, chatisgarh mine shramik sang why was it not called iron ore mine shramik sang it was called chatisgarh mine shramik sang why and there comes the philosophy uh, of niyogi that he had a very by that time he had he roamed around chatisgarh a lot he came from a marxist background so he blended what he had you know he really applied marxism to to delhi rajara and to that area of chatisgarh and basically what he he used to tell us is that you know there are two engines there are two two motors of of social change um uh, one is class struggle the other is national liberation struggle they also generate a huge amount of uh you know i mean 
changes, massive changes happened with national liberation struggles. So actually, he used to say that this is hardly a country. It is a subcontinent. There are so many nationalities in this, sub-nationalities. So uh, his a movement for Chhattisgarh. And remember at that time, Chhattisgarh was not a state. Chhattisgarh was carved out of Madhya Pradesh many, many years later in the year 2000. So we are talking here about the 1970s, where Chhattisgarh was simply the eastern part of Madhya Pradesh. Our, uh, 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 our capital city was far away in Bhopal. Our labor commissioner would be sitting in Indore. Our high court would be sitting in Jabalpur. Like they were all uh, one day and one night's journey away from us. So we were really in the corner out there. So his understanding was that what we have to fight for is for a new democratic Chhattisgarh. And this struggle for a new Chhattisgarh has to be led by the working class. Now, this is the difference. If you have a nationality movement led by the middle class, like Shiv Sena or like the Maharashtra Nam Nirman Sena or something, it is identity based. And after some time, their whole thing becomes a Biharion ko bhagao. So the whole thing turns into a movement of chauvinism. But if it is a movement of the working class, then it will be imbued with a class understanding. So what will be, what will be a, a demand of a, of a Chhattisgarh democratic movement, new democratic movement for a new democratic Chhattisgarh? It would be that, why are we the poor people of a rich land? This is a rich land. It's full of resources. Chhattisgarh is full of resources. But why are the people of Chhattisgarh poor? Because those resources are not distributed among us. Because we, we don't have access to them. Because the workers don't have access to them. The peasants don't have access to them. The resources are not. So the agenda for the nationality, nationality movement of Chhattisgarh led by the working class would be how to distribute the rich resources of Chhattisgarh among the people for the betterment of the people. And this is the understanding with which when he made Chhattisgarh Mind Shramik Sun, the idea was that this union is not only going to get the labor rights of the miners, but it is going to spearhead in the leadership of the working class, the movement for a new Chhattisgarh. And that is exactly what he said about to achieve, uh, which is what is so remarkable uh, about what he did. And uh, so this union started and this union, um, you know, uh, had virtually like, uh, so it, 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 it had a red and green flag right from the beginning. That was like another one of the very deep understandings of Niyogi, where he said that basically it is the uh, worker-peasant alliance. It is the alliance of the workers and the peasants, which is going to create people's power. Because after all, in our country, the working class has, has been, it's a, it, it is a very important part of the working people, but it is still a small part of the working people. Uh, he used to always, always say, uh, I, I don't know how to say it in, in English, that you need to set dahi, you just need a small amount of starter for the dahi. And that is the working class. And that is going to set all the people around whom the working class organizes around itself. And this is the picture which he had uh, with this Lal Hara Jhanda, that, you know, it is... The, the, the workers are going to get organized and then they are going to organize all the surrounding Adivasi villages around the Lira Chara. And that is exactly what they set out to do. So one concept was this worker-peasant alliance. That, that was part of the agenda. The second thing was, what kind of a union are we? So we are not an art Ghanteki union. We are not an eight-hour union. We are a 24-hour union. What does that mean? That means that we are not only concerned with the economic issues of negotiating wage and bonus with the employer. We are concerned with every aspect of life of the work, health, education, marital uh, fights, uh, condition of the muhalla, the cleanliness, the caste questions, the, uh, you know, the, uh, what our families back there in the villages are facing. So basically the idea was that this union is going to touch every aspect of the worker's life. And every aspect of the worker's life has to be uh, considered by the union. So uh, the union had 17 departments. So there was the, uh, you know, it, I mean, there was the Bachat Vibhag, the saving department, which was you know, how do you save your uh, 
there was the mahila vibhag which later on became mahila mukti morcha a separate organization of throne there was the kisan vibhag uh, which became the chatisgarh mukti morcha which is the umbrella uh, organization of the cmss later on it was registered as a political party as well though it was had a very flexible policy regarding election so sometimes we fought elections sometimes we just supported somebody sometimes we opposed somebody sometimes uh, we we canvassed on issues so depending on our strength but we also successfully had uh, mla twice janak lal thakur represented the reserve constituency of the dondi lohara um, uh, on two occasions so there was the kisan vibhag there was the swasthya vibhag which became shahid hospital later on there was the um, sanskriti vibhag which became what was called nava anjor new dawn so that was a beautiful uh, theatrical troupe of people who uh, would uh, go to the villages with the story with the story of adivasi veer narayan singh who was a hero of the 1857 a uh, struggle against the british anti colonial struggle he, he fought a guerrilla warfare against the british veer narayan singh and he was executed in in raipur and uh, so his history niyogi took out and the union was the first to commemorate it so only much later that the congress government also started uh, observing shahid veer narayan singh so uh, there was that there was you know so there was so there was a there was a sudha, uh, football team which was later on named after one young boy who had been martyred shahid sudama so sudama football club so basically the idea was of having a hegemonic culture of the working class our culture culture of the working class observe the shahid divas observe shahid veer narayan singh divas you know uh, so uh, we have our own schools we have our own hospital we have our own cultural troops we so uh, this is you know it was the antithesis of what he used to always joke and say pet ke liye lal jhanda or boat ke liye tiranga jhanda so i mean what is the point of that that you know you you have maybe a left union but that left union you only think about when it comes to your wage and your bonus rest of the things you go to your corporator who may be bjp or congress or whoever it is for for your family matters you go to the caste you know the the community or the the, the caste panchayat which decides whether your daughter is going to get married or whether she is allowed to marry in the caste or you know so you are actually culture or or maybe rest of the time you are celebrating religious festivals you are going from one baba to another baba so basically he wanted that dalli that, that 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 union office has to become the center for the world of the world for the for the workers and indeed that started happening because whenever the families would come to visit people in delhi rajda they would first proudly take them to the union office you know this is our union office this is the school that we have built this is the hospital we have built so it is it was with the idea and he used to say that time and again that the workers have made the whole world there is nothing which is not made by the working class why can't we make our own society and we are not just a lobby which is demanding something we are the creators and we have to create an image of of the new society as we want it the new new socialist society what will it look like and that was his effort but anyway i have uh, skipped over many things because actually the the militant movement of the cms is i mean all this sounds very nice but remember that it was achieved with immense sacrifice and immense struggle the the newly formed union cmss when it came up um had started with a very small demand bans balli bans balli what is bans balli it means you know the bamboos which you need to reconstruct your house after the monsoons you know it's all they're all mud houses so how are you going to live after that so bans balli ka allowance milta hai so they wanted bans balli and the bans balli they struggled for it and there was a settlement for it but actually and, and it was it was with the contractors the settlement was with the contractors but of course the bsp the bhilai steel plant and when i refer to bsp here it means bhilai steel plant not bahujan samaj party so um, so the, the bsp was sitting in the direct the, the district collector was sitting in and all that so that so they um so uh, so so they were there in that agreement they knew the agreement had taken place but later on when the workers went to get that uh the contractor just said no he broke the 
settlement entirely uh, the settlement and uh, that is how on the night of the 2nd and 3rd june 1977 there was a police firing on the workers and um, 11 comrades were murdered that included ansuya bai who was one of the first women leaders of the union jagdish who was uh, was of the union and a small child called sudama balak sudama uh, so 11 people uh, were murdered and how did that happen that happened because in the night of the second when they were sitting on they were you know that time the union office was just a jhopra it was just a small hut and everybody was sitting uh, sleeping around it in the night the police came and abducted nyogi from there and took him off to sagar jail um and that was the time when he was uh, so and this they did time and again and every time it was under national security and this and that so they picked him up and they took him and uh, and um, I, I, and they um, fired in the night in order to take him away and uh, some four people were killed and uh, they, but they forcibly took him away but here's the thing the workers also captured a few policemen they captured them and took, took them with with kept them with them and this is on the night of the 2nd uh, june uh, in the morning it's a strange scene that on one side all the workers along with the captive policemen are there on the other side the collector has come he's using his megaphone and he's saying wo police ke logon ko chhod do and from the other side the workers say aap pehle nahi hogi ko chhodo so you know this is going on and in a sense the simple plain justice which they had they said you leave me or give leave your policeman what is the big deal in that but obviously uh, the state is not going to take this lightly and so there was a second firing in which seven people were killed so that is the way they uh, and 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 so the christening of the cmss was in this blood bath 11 people and then eventually but they they uh, there was huge repression but people still uh, gathered together and the thing about the these the cmss was that it did not organize just in the mines it organized in the mohallas it, it organized with the women it, so you know people just came out to break the section 144 and all that and eventually niyogi came back and that was uh, that is the time when the bilai steel plant understood that it has to negotiate uh with the cmss there's there's just no way uh, that we can avoid this union and so slowly 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 the beginning with bansbali and this and the, then the 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 issues very important issues were raised by by shankar gohan yogi he said that look i mean you you have this uh you know he he demanded i'm sorry uh he um uh he uh, demanded fall back wages so he said look if i am i am coming to work and you don't give me work that is not my problem that is your problem. and you have to give me a certain percentage at least i mean it would be a layoff wage or and that is the only way that this irrational um um uh, irrational um uh system of the mines um um uh, this irrational system of the mines has to end and there has to be a uh, you know you know you can't just have many more workers than you require you need to streamline this and you need to pay people a, a regular uh, income and this is you know struggle after struggle after struggle uh, uh, took place um Uh, please excuse me for a minute. Ha, uh, Dinesh, I am not able to talk about this. I am in the second meeting. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, um, so basically, that it it began with that, and then gradually on the issues of uh, um, uh, of wages and so on, and over time. Uh, i mean i won't go into the details of all that but for example there were times when a struggle had to be extended only so that the men and women get equal wages 
uh, like for example, the Bilai steel plant would say, oh, one is doing loading and one is doing raising. And they are two different kinds of work. So we justify giving different wages. And he would say, no, uh, even if we have to extend the strike for some time more, we will not permit this. The men and women have to get equal wages. And, um, and things like that. So this is a process by which from a three rupee wage, the miners of Dalli Rajara became the highest paid contract workers in the whole country at the time when he was assassinated. And this was, this was obviously uh, in a very slow way. And one of the most important struggles was the struggle against mechanization. So one thing that I've told you is that um, the whole concept of, uh, uh, of making it a 24-hour union and uh, having deep relationship with the countryside, it meant that whenever there were issues in the countryside, the union activists would go and organize. On the other hand, Whenever there was an issue in the union, all the uh, people would come from the villages to support. So it was a very mutual relationship. Um, and that came out to the fore uh, in the anti-mechanization struggle. Now, uh, at that time in the Bailadila mines, mechanization took place and for that 10,000 uh, hutments were burnt and uh, there was a huge repression and, uh, you know, a lot of... Um, um, and and that was the time uh, that 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 was the time when Niyogi, uh, you know, uh, took a demonstration to the to the Bilai steel plant headquarters and planted a black flag and said, "We will not have andhadun machinikar. We will not have indiscriminate mechanization." And he did something extremely creative, which was ki semi mechanization, semi mechanization. So okay, if there is something, for example, sewers should be clean mechanical. There, there, there is no reason why human beings should get into a sewer. Um, one can understand, or something is very dangerous, or something is very, very hazardous. Uh, but in a in an iron ore mine, there are whole chunks of uh, what is called overburden, and then there are uh, there are layers of iron ore. So actually, if you use a mechanized system, the 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 shovel doesn't have eyes; it just picks up everything. But actually, if you do it by human, uh, you know, the overburden can be maybe removed mechanically. But when it comes to raising the ore, nothing can be better than manual raising. So he actually developed a system by which there would be no need to retrench anybody to do it. And he started organizing the youth of the region, saying that if we implement indiscriminate mechanization, the township of Delhi Rajara is going to die. It, it's going to be finished. There will be just a few handful of permanent workers running machines and that's all. Contract workers. Now, this is another lesson that we, we get from Niyogi, which is how to make a united front. And it is sort of inverting the pyramid. The people who are at the bottom should be in the leadership. That is the contract miners. So at the time when they formed the union, they were right at the bottom. The permanent unions also dominated them. The the of course the the contractors and the Bilai steel plant plant management and the district administration and the shopkeepers and everybody culturally dominated. But when it came to the fight against mechanization, it was these contract workers who became the leaders, and everybody came behind them. Uh, the truck owners, because you know once the conveyor belts start, then what is the use of a truck owner? What is the use of a truck? Uh, which, you know, the, the trucks used to carry the iron ore from there to be like. Uh, what about the shopkeepers? I mean, if there, there's no population there, the shopkeepers will go. So all these richer, wealthier and more powerful classes actually gathered behind uh, the working class to say that, no, we will not allow the Rajara to become a ghost city. So that was, that, that is another very interesting experiment. Uh, which he did and in which he was successful at least for that generation of workers. It's a different matter that the Bilai Steel Plant completely finished recruitment after that. And that generation of workers is now most of retiring, dying, and uh, and then the inevitable will happen. The Delhi Rajara mines will become fully mechanized. But at least for that generation, they stood it up. And um, they, they exhibited it politically, socially, economically, through their arguments. And you must remember that the trade union 
in, in strict legal terms, a trade union when you negotiate doesn't have any, any authority to discuss about the technique of production. They say, well, that is our business. You discuss about your wages, we'll protect your uh, employment, we'll do this, we'll do that. But you are nobody to dictate to us what technology we will use. But this is where he organized the society around him. And, and so that was the other uh, one other remarkable thing. And I'll, I'll just uh, end shortly because we need our question answer. Um, and the third remarkable thing which he did, uh, when I say that he created that he hegemonic culture. So actually, Dalli Rajara became a source of people's power. So anything that would happen, you know, uh, Dalli, Dalli Rajara was the place to go and, the, you know, and uh, I'll give you two examples, very interesting examples. One was actually within the union. There were, of course, many factions. There were some splits. Some, uh, one particular um, leader uh, had actually, uh, there, there, was, there was a uh, big factional fight and he had uh, been expelled from the union. And he went and made a, uh, a, a peasant organization in the, in, in the district, in, in the nearby Balur district. And then he was raising a very correct demand, which was that, you see, what happened once the Bhilai steel plant came is that all the dams, which were supposed to be for irrigating, uh, for the irrigation for the farmers, all that water started being diverted towards the Bhilai steel plant. So you, even the British had built them for the purpose of irrigation. But the uh, peasants were never a uh, priority and uh, the, the priority became the industry. So they were actually fighting that water should be released from the Gangrel Dam uh, so that they get water for their crops. And when they did that fight, there was a huge repression upon them. A lot of peasants were jailed. Uh, their total repression. Now, look at the political maturity of Shankar Gwani. Now, this is being ha happening under the leadership of somebody whom you have had very bitter fight with. I mean, virtually you have expelled him uh, from, from the uh, organization and so on. But when it came to that issue, the next day, the, the, the miners of Delhi Rajara hit the streets and they said all the peasants must be unconditionally released and all their bicycles have to be returned. And the water must be released from Gangrel Band. If that does not happen within, all this does not happen within 72 hours, we'll close down the mines. Of course, they had the strength to do that. And that happened. So the concept of solidarity has to go beyond the narrow confines of We have to use our strength in solidarity in a very practical manner. That is one example. The other thing is what happened during the 1984 riots, Sikh genocide. You see, before that, a uh, very interesting thing, uh, which had, uh, you know, uh, one of the major movements uh, of Niyogi uh, in that period, uh, in the early 80s, was because the wages had suddenly gone up for the workers. From three rupees, they had you know, become hundreds of rupees. So people started drinking a lot. And then the question was, how do we get away from this? And the beauty of it is that Niyogi, when he, when he talked about liquor, did not talk about it only from a moral point of view. He talked about it from an organizational and a political point of view. And he said, look at this. What the employer gives you from one hand the Sharab Thekedar is taking away from the other hand. And he used to say that, you know, an organized, you know, have a perfectly decent meeting and put in one drunk man and everything is gone. So, you know, having one drunk person in your organization will just ruin everything. You can't have a meeting. You can't decide anything. You can't, I mean, it's all. Uh, so, the, and for this, he realized that the women, the women were fighting with the men very strongly, but in their own houses. And in their own houses, they were powerless. And the man would say, oh, you get out and this is my house and so on and so forth. You, if you don't like it, my drinking, I am drinking with my own money and so on and so forth. There would be a lot of violence, domestic violence. He actually, uh, Mahila Mukti Morcha was the one who took up the anti, uh, 
um, anti alcohol campaign and he said we'll deal with your husbands the union will deal with your husbands but you deal with the liquor contracts and so huge rallies of women started being taken up and they used to go and smash the bottles of the liquor contractors so um, and the very interesting things used to happen i mean a, a wife and children would bring a drunk husband to the to the union office and the union would simply take away his uh, pay and give it to the woman and say you you are not uh, capable of looking after this now you know we'll give it to your wife so and then that is the time when they started you know all drunk people were supposed to report to the union office and then there would be plays and there would be carrom and there would be football and there would be you know and keep people occupied do things other things with people don't let them go and get drunk so uh, whatever way you can so all kinds of creative ways uh, were used to wean people of alcohol and believe it or not some 40000 people gave up drinking and Delhi Rajara State Bank of India for that year had the highest number of fixed deposits in any rural branch, which means he actually encouraged people that you know, I mean, this is you need to have a decent life, and for that decent life, first respect yourself, uh, respect your family, and uh, you know, stop this drinking. So now many of those liquor contractors were Sikhs, and number of some of them from the bhatia uh, family uh, had actually taken uh, had uh, there were assassination attempts on on niyogi so uh, so people hated them but what happens in 1984 in 1984 actually at that time there was a movement going on in the bnc mills uh, uh, bengal nagpur cotton mills uh, at the same time as you know the tata summons movement was going on in bombay the textile mill in rajnandgaon was also on strike and the union people leaders were there and they were on hunger strike that day when as soon as niyogi heard on the radio that indira gandhi has been assassinated by her sikh bodyguards he said look wrap up this our economic demand is not the most important thing now and he went back to tali rajara and with megaphones the union uh you know went around the entire uh, area saying all six are free to come to the union office for shelter something more than 100 families of six from all around came and they were sheltered there they were given dal bhat by the union they they lived there and in fact it was they who brought those sharab thekedars and said with inke paon padho aap niyogi ke that you know this is the man who has saved us so rising above the petty politics if he had just given one ishara ki mauka mil gaya ab saale inko thok do what would have happened and those 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 six would have been murdered in their bed but he was a very it was principle it was a point of principle it was it was not to be as a part of a sikh genocide it was to be a part of a working class struggle that he wanted to defeat them he didn't want to defeat them this way and you know so they were remarkable you know and there 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 was such a foresight in many of these political decisions anyway there's no time really to go into many many interesting things but i think these are a few things that we have to learn how do we create a culture of the working class where we deal with these issues of communalism and casteism uh, all that within our union patriarchy how do we deal with with all those things how do we uh, address those those questions how do we build forge solidarities with people around i mean solidarity was the creed of the cnss anywhere in chatisgarh there is a repression it is a job of the cmss to go or the cmm to go and support creating solidarity as a creed and that solidarity cannot be abstract you know when you say workers of the world unite that's fine i mean but it's very abstract people don't understand it ki which workers which world i mean where how who are they but when it came to chatisgarh people understood it it's my village it's my next door village it's my next door taluka it's my next door district and that that you have to be solidarity in action not in words solidarity in action uh is the way of raising the consciousness that and he did 
create a mass political consciousness uh, of this nature and so many uh, for so many when there was a police firing in abhanpur the cmm was there when there was a latur earthquake the cmm was there in harsud when the the uh, houses narmada movement was there people would go bhopal gas tragedy people would go you know it was a, it became a creed a solidarity is our creed we have to work this way so unfortunately the life was cut too short and that you can tell the difference between the public sector and the private sector by this fact that from 1977 to 1989 when he was in the mines which were the captive iron ore mines of the bilai steel plant which was a public sector they harassed him they victimized him they put him in jail they did many things with him they did not kill him in from 89 he entered bilai by 91 he was murdered first they tried to extern him he wasn't extern we won in the high court and then he was extern from the whole world he was just shot assassinated so the the private sector could not have patience even for 2 years to deal with him and that that is why today the the opponents we have you know the 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 the, the crony capitalists whom we are fighting now are so powerful uh, that organizing against them is so so tough Uh, that we we are not even allowed to build up that threshold strength so i will just stop here i'm really sorry i have overshot my time uh, uh, and i think the rest can come in questions and answers but but uh, i think uh, if you want to know more you want to learn more about this um, there was an article i had written for the ek2 magazine uh, which was uh, published last year uh, on on 28 september um uh, which has many of these points but the real source material if you want to go to be patient read it in hindi read it in sangat shob nirman so uh, i would encourage all those of you who know english uh, who know hindi to please try and read from that book okay thank you i'll stop here <laughs> uh comrades please excuse me the noise i think there's some ganesh chaturthi processions going on outside um but uh, i think we have ton of questions in our chat box and um, uh, i'll just start reading some of these i think we can proceed with the question answer session and then um, those of you who are yet to ask a question please put it in the chat box i'll read it out for you um so zahirul asks that i heard that comrade shankar gohan yogi assisted dr richaria in building a rice germ Jump plasm bank in Bastar. I also came to know that organic farming is practiced in some part of Bastar. Can you please describe the present scenario? Um. Yes. Actually, uh, uh, he did. He he. Uh, in fact, uh, Doctor Richaria uh, was uh, uh, was was a person Yogi re deeply respected, and um, uh and actually uh, um a comrade of the cmm later and that is after niyogi ji passed away uh, comrade jacob uh, actually started collecting the varieties of rice it was said that there were about 40000 varieties of indigenous rice in chatisgarh uh, you would be surprised to know that that entire collection has been sold to a multinational to i think syngenta or somebody i forget that but that was gathered by um by 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 the even by the agricultural college of uh, uh, of chatisgarh but that is basically because uh, it was you know uh, irrigated land is very little in chatisgarh and even today it's very little so it it was really uh, so the the, the traditional uh, farming was really the, there were a lot of seeds which did not need much water but the moment the shift came to you know this green revolution uh you needed more water you needed more fertilizer you needed more pesticide and so on and so forth and that whole cycle now the chatisgarh farmer has got caught up in that cycle and it is really uh really very uh, dangerous for them because now with climate change the monsoons are failing and if you don't have water and as i said all the earlier irrigation dams everything is being diverted to, to industry and this is where the farmers have actually you know uh who who are the main stay who are the backbone in chatisgarh most people are middle farmers they are not very many rich farmers but they are more middle and subsistence level farmers uh, it is not so um 
so you know hierarchical but um, uh, but they they are they are in a, in a terrible crisis because they just can't cannot make ends meet and that is why uh, the jila kisan sang rajnan gaon which had a very strong movement in the present uh, uh, you know and went to join the farmers movement at the delhi border three times during that one year three times once with 200 people once with 300 people <laughs> so so they completely uh, resonated with that demand for msp law because uh, and as far as organic farming in bastar is concerned bastar doesn't have anything else but organic farming where are you going to get the fertilizers and pesticides and all that so actually that that is the healthiest way of farming the problem in bastar is different the problem is that you are you losing going to lose your land if you don't fight for it you are going to lose your land to mining companies because the entire land is covered with prospecting leases and mining leases uh and yeah and the government is just waiting to clear the place of adivasis as soon as possible so that they can you know hand those over to the companies so that is a different question but yes uh, this was also very much part and see this is uh, his very scientific understanding combined with you know understanding of chatisgarh real uh, you know you know granular understanding nitty gritty of chatisgarh ki the you know that we must preserve these these things of chatisgarh we have almost lost those drought uh, drought um, uh, resistant varieties now because just been pushed out by all the hybrid varieties uh comrade the next question comes from shorna book he asked that there is a growing tendency of diverting the working class movement into legalism i mean instead of mobilizing workers some prominent trade unions are appealing to judiciary and waiting for the verdict the judiciary in the western countries have supported the uh, supported forming unions uh, in amazon and starbucks on the contrary the indian judiciary has been essentially reactionary especially after the after 2014 uh being a trade union activist and lawyer at the same time what do you think i completely agree with you <laughs> first of all uh and i became a lawyer because sometimes you don't have a choice but to go to the court but i would say be very careful pick your battles pick your battles Uh, when do you go to the court and when do you not go to the court i mean the farmers were really smart when they didn't go to the court when they sat for one year on the borders of delhi they did not go to the court they were pretty smart the court would have first day told them remove your dharna you know <laughs> that was the first day. so we need to know our strength now the problem is when you're saying that many of the leaders are tending towards legalism it's because we are weak now so what is happening is that the the um, uh, the polarization within the working class that you know there's a very minuscule permanent workers you know even in the big industries they're not even 10% in bilai steel plant i will give you an example bilai steel plant started with 96000 permanent workers one of whom was shankar goyal okay now today there are 10 to 12000 permanent workers and 40 to 50000 contract workers that is the ratio now and this is in in a steel plant where you still need more it it is uh, um, but other places like the cement plants of adani and 100% contract workers there are no permanent workers at all can you imagine you are running entire you know aluminum plants and steel plants and power plants and cement plants without a single permanent worker so the problem is that on the one hand it is important to preserve the the some labor laws which exist which actually are still only applicable to that very small minuscule minority it is important to preserve it um but it is also important for the permanent workers to realize that they can't win their battle unless they take everybody along with them and this has to be a united thing of expanding the labor rights so it can't be that you know like a sore thumb you are going to stick out and say you know we want 100 rupees and everybody else has 3 rupees so maybe you will have to say okay i don't want 100 rupees i want 70 rupees but let everybody get at least 40 to 50 rupees you know we we have to uh we have to broaden our movement 
And I completely agree that legalism is not a solution and legalism, you know, uh, there's a there's an article, if that person is interested, you can get in touch with me. And, uh, in the first phase when I was uh, re released on bail, I did a project on Contract Labor Act. So how the contract, this is the rise and fall of the Contract Labor Act. So how it came about and how it has been ineffective and been made ineffective and how deliberately the judiciary has finished off the Contract Labor Act. Uh, by a, there's a judgment called the sale judgment. You might be familiar with it. It's a seven judge judgment, you know. And before that, there was a, a, a judgment called the Air India Statutory Corporation. I'm giving you an example of how the judiciary is functioning. The Air India Statutory Corporation basically said that in the few that that in the areas where contract labor has been abolished, suppose people have been working as contract labor for decades together. Then when they go to a court, they should be absolved. That's what the Air India Statutory Corporation said. The sale judgment overturned this. And what they said was that if you come up against and uh, come up saying that, okay, in the work which I'm doing, contract labor is in abolished. I am a contract laborer working for 30 years. They'll say, okay, throw all these people out and have regular recruitment. Which idiot is going to go to the court to have their job lost? Nobody is going to go. So you have ensured that there is no way you can go to the court. And now, with the four labor courts, the whole concept of a contract worker aspiring to become a permanent worker one day, you know, a regular worker one day and have all those things will be gone because the contract labor act is going to be abolished. And you will have fixed term contracts. So you'll be working anyway for three years and four years and five years. There's no concept of permanency. The concept, the permanent worker has been abolished now, not the contract worker by the four labor codes. So really, legally, we have very little choice. But the problem is that for workers, you know, when you try to get your rights, those laws are very weakly applied. The labor laws are very ineffectively applied, no, there's no inspection, there's no this thing, the labor inspector, nothing happens. But the moment you do a gherao, three months, you, six months, you haven't been paid and you gherao, then it becomes law and order. Then you are immediately put in like the Maruti workers and then you uh, maybe suffer for years together. So there you don't have a choice of not going to the court. You have to go to the court. So you have to pick your battles. You have to pick your battles. And I would say, and even as a lawyer, when I was working in uh, in Chhattisgarh High Court, I would say walking on two legs. Sadak ki ladai or kagas ki ladai. And you have to walk, walk on two legs. I mean, sometimes only having the sadak ki ladai, you know, then they do something in the law which just finishes you. But only doing the law, you know, then even if you get an order in your favor, you'll never be able to get it implemented. You don't have the strength to do that. So it has to be a combination. You have to walk on two legs. Um, and yes, uh, and definitely legalism anyway will apply to a minuscule minority of the working class now. 93% is ununionized or maybe even more. I don't know. There, there's no union at all. So uh, it's a very pathetic condition. Yes. The next question comes from Sweta. No, I, uh, Acha, whoever asked the question, please, if you uh, if you have something to add or if I have not been able to answer you, please allow them also to say a few words in case they want to. <laughs> yes, comrades. Uh, please uh, type out uh, that in chat box so that I can get back to you. And um, I mean, we can, um, you know, have your questions on this or any anything, your suggestions, your opinions, etc. Please type it out in the chat box kindly. Um, the next comes from Shweta. Uh, the frequency and intensity of militant working class movement have decreased. Mo movement have decreased after the nineties. Informali uh, informalization, contractualization have decreased the scope of workers to get organized as before. How to overcome such obstacles faced by the working class? That is the question which I think all of us are asking ourselves. And uh, I don't think there are very many straightforward answers to that. Uh, you must remember that all the labor laws, when did they come? They all came after the Russian Revolution. 
<laughs> so before that, when there were no laws at all, and the workers had no choice, they were organizing underground. They became actually very political, and <laughs> they actually overthrew the the, the Russian monarchy. So <laughs> the the Tsar. So uh, actually, after that, there was a sort of honeymoon period between labor and capital, where capital realized that you know, kuch negotiation hona chahiye. There should be a you know formal structure. There should be labor law and so on and so forth, so that you know we don't have everyday dealing with strikes and unrest and this and that. We we need to come to the table and negotiate and so on. So that honeymoon period lasted for some time. and uh, including in india it lasted for some time the 90s was you know it was not only niyogi who was assassinated datta samant was assassinated i mean his was not a very left or marxist or but it was a huge like 2 lakh textile workers datta samant was murdered sabdar hashmi was murdered the same year so with along with the lpg policies came a spate of attacks on whatever unions existed and they were very 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 uh, debilitating attacks and today really the working class is very powerless see what we have to remember is that for example the farmers they could sit it out for one year at the delhi borders because they're not the poorest of the poor they're rich farmers but they also organize right from the landless in their villages to the nris sitting in 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 you know canada and uk from there to there the entire punjab society came behind the adatiyas came behind and the shopkeepers came behind they took the lead but they had staying power today the working class does not have staying power and uh, you know and that is that is obvious from the way people walked in the lockdown they they have no staying power and that situation which we are seeing uh how is it you know what is going to be the uh, how is this going to be changed now one thing which happens i'll give you an example hundreds of people are working in a factory there no labor laws to mention nothing how many accidents take place you know when when an accident takes place a worker falls from somewhere is lying dead at that time a spontaneous you know a uh, struggle happens people often agitate with that body saying until you give us 5 lakh rupees until you give the family 5 lakh rupees or 10 lakh rupees we are not going to let you cremate the body they for the time being succeed and then of course all the people who led that movement are weeded out because they are all contract workers there is no union there is no organization and then it finishes to patake ki tarah you know it's like a pataka it is not like a mashal which goes on burning for a long time it's like a pataka which comes and goes that is the way workers because it is not as if people don't understand it, that they 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 idiots they they don't want to organize or they want that's not the case they are fighting for their survival but they have to choose if they fight today they may not have a job tomorrow what will they do so until they see something tangible that you know okay you know if we put our lot in with this union we might win something so that is not visible on the horizon but when things become very bad very very bad then people have no choice but to fight and it is them we should be looking out for it is their voices we have to amplify it is their struggle we have to support and then sooner or later that will uh permeate other parts of the society it's not an easy thing and i really don't have any solution for this uh, uh my our own union uh, you know has been decimated uh, now the lirajara that that entire generation is no more and everybody is on contract in the next generations um in bilai the struggle which we had uh from 1991 4000 workers had been thrown out they are still out of contract it is only the acc company with whom we managed to get a settlement now acc has been taken over by adani and they are refusing to accept the settlement so we are back at square one so it it is it is really like you know sisyphus rolling up the stone and the stone is coming back roll it up again it's coming back so ultimately these are going to be political struggles in the long run um, but how and what form they will take we don't know but we have to keep at it 
we have to keep organizing, we have to keep amplifying the voice of the uh, of of you know the the most downtrodden among them. Yes. I see someone has raised their hand, but Comrade, I'd request you to type your message out in the chat box. We have a lot of messages and uh, we have to sort of bit by bit move to answer everybody's questions. Um, also, ma'am, I'd like to state that um, I'd be interested in reading your project, so I'd reach out to you at some point. <laughs> Certainly, I'll, I'll send it to you and you can share it with whoever wants. Yes, yes, sure. Also, uh, comrades, please reach out to me if somebody is interested in Suha ma'am's project. I'll share it with you. Okay, the next comes from Harsh. This isn't related to Chhattisgarh movement. Please share some bits of left trade union history from Uttar Pradesh if you have any and some reading materials as well. Um, why left movements have been so weak in Ut Uttar Pradesh is what he asks. Now that is a place where I have to say that I'm very ignorant. I'm actually not a very reading kind of person. I'm I'm very practical. I I, <laughs> I read and study what I require to to work and fight. So I really, I'm not the right person to answer this. I'm sure they have been. In Gorakhpur, I know definitely there have been a uh, lot of movements. Um, in, in isolated factories, I remember uh, um, many times uh, there have been, uh, there was one, uh, um, but but I, I really can't uh, say much about the history there. I do know that you know I mean Chhattisgarh is a very specific kind of you know it's a it it is a it was a mine it there was Adivasi area there, you know so there there are many specificities which uh, which uh, help to to uh, strengthen yogi's movement which might not be there in other places. I I am very aware of that, but uh, sorry I I won't be able to. Uh, uh, yes, uh, one one thing which I am aware of is the the Swadeshi movement. See the the textile mills of Kanpur. You must read the history of the textile mills of Kanpur. How uh, there were massive struggles there, and how the entire you know textile industry was just uh, completely shut down. It's it's uh, and you remember Kanpur conspiracy case, Meerut conspiracy case. Actually, the role of working class in the in the anti colonial movement. Uh, was very strongly centered around these places, particularly Kanpur. Uh, um, I think you, you should read those if you can. Uh, but I, 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 you need to talk to somebody who knows Uttar Pradesh better. Sorry. Now the next question comes from Dhuni. Um, so this is something that I think we'll all be interested to know. Uh, what do you think about the present students' awareness of the social and political scenario of the country? What are the things that motivated you to leave the lavish academic life and go to work for the downtrodden? I was also interested in your life in IIT Kanpur and what do you think about the role of elite institution like IITs for social change? Um, yes, actually, that that's uh, I think that that is very relevant. Um, so uh, for for us actually we are a very uh, interesting generation uh, because in our time um, uh, and our coming of age is just the early 80s i mean uh, i i joined uh, cmm in 83 or 84 and several major things happened at that time remember 1984 bhopal gas tragedy 1984 6 genocide. So, you know, actually there was an unraveling which was happening. Um, but there were strong people's movements at that time. Narmada Bachao Andolan was a very strong movement. A lot of people flocked to it, those who were environmentalists and so on. Nyogi's movement was a very strong movement. The textile movement was... So, you could see people's movements. And let me tell you one thing. At that time, we were very, very lucky that there were not many NGOs. <laughs> so... That was not an option for us. Joining an NGO was not an option. So either you become a professional, professional lawyer, professional teacher, professional, you know, whatever, or you join a people's movement. So, you know, this in-between uh, comfort zone, which is there, na, that you uh, retain your middle-class lifestyle, but you think you're doing something very progressive. Ye jo option NGO ne, uh, dala na, beech mein, wo tha nahi hamare paas. And I think that did us a lot of good because a lot of people joined the movements and people who could not join the movements as professionals supported the movements. 
so maybe as a doctor maybe as a journalist maybe as a teacher maybe as a researcher maybe as an environmentalist they would support the movement they would they, they maybe would not live in the movement or but many people actually you know gave up and went and joined like me um uh, so how did i do it why did i do it now of course a, a, a lot of that credit some of that credit goes to my mother who was always a socialist she was the um founder of the uh, center for economic studies and planning in jnu i had a childhood in jnu where all around me i saw uh, a lot of left politics left student politics and where people were really debating uh, questions and uh, my mother herself had a very uh, interesting series of phd students there was sunil gupta who then uh, uh, who 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 went and lived in an adivasi rural area he quit his phd there was sitaram yachuri who was also a student who quit and then uh, joined the cpm uh, so we could see that there were people grappling with uh, not just studying society but changing society and those people were all around us so uh, i think that made a lot of difference then i went to iit kanpur yes uh, all of the elite institutions actually it is not an upper class there there is a very small proportion which is going to change sides it's a very small proportion uh, and um, active group which organize the mess workers which organize the student senate which um, so uh, and uh, i remember i started uh, you know with a, uh, with a few students and professors there with the marxist study circle so it is even in the elite institution we have that and i think that was important i think the widening of the social base which places like jnu gave is also very important you know somebody like a kanhaiya could come and study you know uh, I, i remember one of my uh, mothers uh some uh, you know a student who later on became head of department economics in kakataya university came from banjara tribe and when she had initially come to jnu she was uh, you know felt so sort of out of place and say she was weeping and wanting to go home and i remember my uh, mother offering that she can come and stay at our house uh, so you know they because of all those backwardness regional backwardness points you know there was an effort by the jnu to integrate people who did not speak english who came from far away places who came from deprived backgrounds it's not just reservation it's also acceptance inclusion respect uh, and the institution feeling that it needs those people to come in you know that has to be the spirit otherwise uh, people go to iit and they they commit suicide i mean it happens all the time because the 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 culture there is so cutthroat competition there is no sense of exclusion uh, yeah, inclusion that you have there so i think elite institutions you see uh, they play a role in in many strange ways i'll i'll give you a recent example that um, in the struggle in odisha which is happening against the posco movement uh, posco company uh they had uh, uh, they had managed to uh, you know uh, kick out posco but then the jindal uh, the jindal company uh, sajan jindal uh, jsw uh, has started there and again people were struggling against it and so on you would wouldn't believe it but it was the op jindal global university from where faculty and students actually wrote letters about this i mean they are paying huge fees i mean obviously those 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 kids don't come from normal backgrounds they come from very rich backgrounds but they have excellent faculty and they do they must be having some freedoms because they actually <laughs> wrote against this uh, and the force the jindal company to negotiate so you know yes i mean i think uh, uh, the the elite institutions have a role uh, some incredibly uh, perseverant young activists come from such kind of backgrounds but overall the broadening of the social base is even more important needs to be done um and uh, yeah so so that was my history also was that i i i got uh, involved in the work, working class movement basically because 
uh, we were in, always interested uh, in in workers and my introduction to this was with the construction workers who were outside the JNU campus at the time of the Asiad. 1982 that you know Appu Asiad business so there were a lot of these flyovers and all these things being constructed and they would be huge you know they were like concentration camps were barbed wire settlements in which people would be brought from Rajasthan from Chhattisgarh people were construction laborers there appalling conditions and we as students uh, there were some students from Ames who would put up medical camps there were some of us who would go and teach so we went and saw that and uh, an incident that happened was that a, a friend of us was an Odia and talked to an Odia worker and he broke down and he said that, you know, we are all very sick and we can't even go back because the Thekedar is not giving us tickets to go back. And we are miserable. And the next day when we went, he was not there. What happened to him? Nobody knows. So that is, I think, that was my first shock when I realized that, you know, it's not enough to just be sympathetic. You have to be there and be with people. You have to, you know, suffer through thick and thin with them. You have to be there with them. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, just outside sympathy doesn't help. It might even harm them. So that is, I think, where I decided. And, uh, in 83, Nyogi again had been arrested and sent under the NSA. And it was when we went to the Birla uh, textile mill that we saw, saw a, a procession being carried out for his release. So we said, who is this Shankar? As students, we campaigned for his release. I think that was it. I, I went and I looked, went to the Lirajara and I saw uh, that union and I just fell in love with it. I quit everything my, I was doing an MPhil then. I quit my studies and I went and joined the union. So I think uh, combination of factors. I, my mother was a socialist and the JNU background and those experience with the workers. And of course, the, the, the inspiration of CMSs. Yeah. So all those things uh, helped a lot. Okay, comrades, before we move on to the next question, I'd like to call upon comrades Sri to make an announcement. And also, uh, I see, Comrade, you have a question. You can directly ask it to uh, Comrade Sudha. So, um, uh, I would just wanted to make an announcement that uh, our Spark October issue is out. And uh, please grab a copy. Uh, we've shared a link, Google Forms link, in the chat box. Uh, to get keep in touch with uh, future updates of Spark, uh, please fill in your contact details, and um, also follow us on Instagram at the Spark Mag, and our Proton Mail is there in the link tree where you can uh, send in feedback, articles, artworks that you'd like to have published in our magazine. Thank you, thank you, Arun. Comrade, do you want to raise a question? Uh, I see you have one in the chat box. You, you may as well uh, directly ask it. So I think that question did not come from Shilakshmi. It came from someone else. Uh, okay, okay. Um, okay. Um, comrades, we will take questions. I uh, After we uh, finish the ones in the chat box, we will... Um, allow some of you to speak um but uh, for, for that we'll have to just uh, finish this questions uh, the, the ones in the chat box already so uh, the next comes from somebody called Dell. how can student movements overcome the present fascist era we have to stick it out <laughs> um one thing is i think we need to be broad, we need to be deep. Um, and I think we should not, you know, sometimes uh, I know that as students, it's very important for us to read and study and debate. and But, you know, sometimes we get involved in the, you know, hair splitting debates uh, and uh, there are a lot of sectarian attitudes creep up amongst us. You know? 
So one group will say, oh, that group is like this, this group will like this. So we label each other. We are, you know, I think uh, fascism is precisely a time when A, as I said, wherever people are fighting, you see, it's not that people don't fight, but they, they, some people have no choice but to fight. We have, if we have to find our way of amplifying that fight. It could be as a journalist that you go and you report about it or you write about it or you, you know, uh, nowadays social media is such a wonderful medium. You take videos about it, you talk about it. And some, some people are doing some very, very good work. I mean, I think the amount of information which has come out, let us say, about manual scavengers, about, you know, about, uh, uh, about, about the atrocities on Dalits, about the atrocities on women, the atrocities on minorities, which have come out because of social media, which which is, I mean, it is a very dangerous medium. It's also a very democratic medium. So it has both, you know, it has the both sides of the sword are there. But amplifying the voices of the people who are fighting, whoever is fighting. And secondly, that, of course, you have to sharpen your own understanding politically, do a lot of reading, do a lot of studying, do a lot of research. But you also have to be in, in in your work, in your practice, try to have the broadest possible unity. You know, this is a, another thing that you learn from the farmers' movement. There were 28 organizations, right? Ra ranging from uh, Gandhian to ML. There was everybody there. And the interesting thing is, almost all the organizations uh, from which, which these farmers' bodies came were all unhappy with their farmer leaders because they all felt the, Are, you, you didn't you know, strictly go according to the line and all that. All of them had to compromise with their line in order to forge this alliance. And they were smart enough and sensible enough to do it. Had they listened to all their respective parties, there would have been 28 of them separate. I'm really serious about this. So when it comes to actually... I'm not saying you don't sharpen your understanding, that you, uh, that you don't debate your understanding, you don't try. To, of course you do, you must. But you know, don't refuse to work with somebody else because we are too small. We have to, you know, let us agree to disagree on a few things and let us decide to walk together. You know, abhi to saw kadam chalna hai. Uh, on the way, we will all discover what is right and what is wrong. You are right or I am right. Or hai. I mean, those, some of the debates can be kept for later. Na? <laughs> Let's, at least come together and do something. I think that would be my message to to you guys um, that you know have have broader plat have broad platforms. Um, you know, many times, you know there is there is say uh, uh, I mean for example even the, the women wrestlers protest. You know those were very apolitical young women. They were Jat women. They were from Haryana. They came from a very macho culture. They, uh, uh, some of them were, must have been BJP inclined even before they came uh, to fight there. But once they came, you know, it was like being in the sea of the people. It was like being in the sea of the people. And I must appreciate the action of Bhim Army President Chandrasekhar of going and standing with them in solidarity. He's merely going and standing there shut up the mouths of all those who are saying, oh, these are all jat women, you know, they're, they're sub elite log hain, ye sub aise hain, aise hain. Because he said, look, okay, but I am with the constitution and the constitution is against this treatment of women, the treating women this way. And I am, I am with this. And I think that shows a remarkable broad-mindedness in him as a Dalit leader. Remarkable broad-mindedness in him. Because it is not as if the jat Dalit Problems are unknown in Haryana. They are very much known. They are very much known. You know. But again, you know, farmers' movement also dealt with all this. The caste question, the patriarchy question, when the women came driving the tractors down. So, you know, somewhere you have to have faith that a people's movement, you know, you have to distinguish between antagonistic contradiction with the enemy and non-antagonistic contradictions among the people. You know, some of us make the non-antagonistic contradictions into antagonistic contradictions. <laughs> you just refuse to work with each other. Are, yaar, hamana difference to bahut thoda hai. And frankly, the state doesn't even see the difference. It doesn't even recognize the difference. It will beat all of us with the same danda and put us all in jail together. So, 
I mean, what are we fighting about? So, I'm not saying don't have differences. Of course, we do and we need to have those differences. We need to discuss, debate, research, study all the time. But we should not let that become sectarianism. And remember, the people never want sectarianism. The people will always say, why don't you guys unite? Why don't you guys unite? This is the constant refrain you will hear from, from the people. They'll say, we, we can't see the difference between that group and this group. Why don't you guys unite? <laughs> yes, there might be differences. And so we might decide to set them aside for some time. Or we might decide some different forum in which we discuss those. But at the moment, let us put our small forces together because we are facing a huge monster. Okay, we'll take one another um, question from the chat box and then we'll make the platform open for anybody who wants to directly ask their questions. Please raise your hand and I'll call upon you to ask your question directly um, to Comrade Sudha. Uh, this question comes from Aurindam. He asks, Comrade, how should we, uh, how should the question of political power to the working class and the peasantry be addressed in the trade union movement? We see the trade union movement in general has a tendency to get overwhelmed with questions or with economic questions and the political question gets sidelined. Absolutely. Um, that's very correct. And this is where, you see, with the working class, many times the questions of survival are so basic. You know, whether where tomorrow's need is going to come from, whether I will still be in a job or tomorrow. Questions. But even when we lead these economic questions, I mean, look at Newby. When he came there, they, they were very uh, deep. I mean, if you're earning three rupees a day in 1977, and, you know, the, the contractor could do as they please with you and as they please with your wife. And, uh, you know, uh, there was every kind of exploitation, including sexual, happening there in those mines. Um, then, um, but there, then the question comes of the leadership. And having a leadership like Niyogi's made a huge difference. We have to be very patient. You know, okay, I think climate change is the most important issue. So I am going to go and talk to the working class about climate change. Yeah, for them, they are going to get organized on some very basic questions. But over time, as they have their faith in you, as they understand, as you teach them and you, you be with them when they do solidarity with other people and all that, gradually these issues will start permeating. And then maybe you can uh, uh, you can uh, like like Niyogi managed to do that he managed to get the CMSS people involved in the Narmada movement. He managed to get them to to protest against the uh, attack on Dadar. He managed to get them to protest against uh, uh, the killing of Ramesh Pereira from a different uh, ML group altogether in in uh, in Abhanpur, in Raipur. Uh, he managed to get them to do many many things uh, because they. Uh, because they slowly ad uh, adopted solidarity, as I said, as their creed. So I think politics is at many levels. One is the political understanding of the leadership. One is the mass. Then secondly comes the political understanding of the karyakartas, with whom one, you know, it is still a very, up, uh, uh, you know, top top-down attitude in many organizations between the leaders and the karyakartas. And it has to be far more democratic, far more engaging, far more, you know, as, let us say, as, uh, uh, you know, we have had the privilege of education, we have the privilege of knowing history, we have the privilege of knowing science. I mean, often it is said uh, that, you know, uh, Niyogi Ji to, uh, used to say always that, you know, what are the sources of knowledge? So you would say, uh, class struggle, struggle for production, history, and science. Now, when it comes to class struggle and when it comes to the struggle of production, nobody knows it better than the workers. Nobody understands the, the, the production process better than the workers. 
and when it comes to class struggle nobody is as firm as they are much firmer than you and me but the advantage we have is we have a knowledge of history we have a knowledge of science it is our duty to share that with our comrades who have not been so privileged who have not had that chance to learn you know who have not had a chance to study history and to study science so i think uh, politicization of our karyakartas and a mass politicization you see what niyogi managed to do you see on the one hand we organize people on very today issues wage bonus this that and then we talk tell them acha now you know we need to do revolution revolution is not something which is visible tangible understandable um so he actually had an, some in between things which people could aspire for which they could imagine ki yeah, chatisgarh aisa hona chahiye you know um in fact that whole hamar sapna ke chatisgarh जहां सबला पिए के पानी मिली यू नो वेर एवरीबडी विल हैव वॉटर टू ड्रिंक वेर एवरीबडी विल हैव हाउस वेर यू नो दे सो दिस इज द वे ही कंस्ट्रक्टेड दिस कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ द न्यू छत्तीसगढ़ विच बिकेम वेरी एंडियरिंग टू पीपल सो मास पोलिटिकल काउंसिल सो ऑन दिस थ्री लेवल्स वी हैव टू एजुकेट द लीडर्स हैव टू ऑल्सो बी एजुकेटेड पोलिटिकली द कार्यकर्ताज हैव टू बी educated the the people have to be educated and the leaders cannot be wo bolte the ki you know the leaders can't be 100 steps ahead of the workers they have to be three steps ahead of the workers five steps ahead of the 10 steps ahead of the not 100 steps you know then your your consciousness and the, you know there is a huge chasm i mean what is the politics of that how how are you politicizing people I mean, you may be very political it's fine but actually what they are concerned with is there you know are they going to get their bonus are they going to be thrown out of their job are they going to be so these are very uh, vexed questions and they need to be dealt with in a very practical down to earth manner i mean i don't know how to i'm not very good at explaining this i'm afraid <laughs> we have to have trust on people that people can understand particularly our karyakartas particularly karyakartas um comrades we'll start taking direct questions now um we'll start from sachin could you unmute yourself and um ask your question um uh, me and shiganga i'll be very happy to together. see to see the faces of whoever is asking me a question yeah. i am rather tired of only uh, uh, devjani and i are looking at each other <laughs> i don't even know where where is there oh, there is a some blur thing come so yeah, three yeah. of us have joined from one account i think yeah. it's uh, shiganga's question hello hi yeah. uh, so the question was uh, you mentioned ngos Uh, so um, a lot of us are from azim prem ji university who have attended attending this talk so uh, what do you think about the role of, of ngos and the area they work in and how do they uh, what challenges do the movements face because of them that was the best see uh, look uh, please don't take what i'm saying as an anti ngo diet right it is not i'm i'm not going to be like uh, you know uh, mm-hmm. um and i do uh, see the thing the, the problem with the ngo the difference between okay let, let's put it this way uh, the difference between how we work in a people's movement and how we work in an ngo the the people's movement responds to questions demands of the people the ngo already has its project set out for it so it has to work on toilets or it has to work on uh, women safety or it has to work on uh, um uh, birth control or it has to work on so it has an agenda which is not decided by the people that is the first problem and because of that uh, and then what we do is that in order to function with the people we go we uh, induct karyakartas we we in fact take away the best people from among best persons from among the people and they become the ngo karyakartas but after some time their accountability to the people ceases and they 
their accountability through NGO increases. So they have to do, you know, they have to fill up the forms and make the reports and do the projects and do <laughs> all that. So the whole notion that they will help to organize people and all that would distance budget. So after some time, the NGO becomes a nicer version of the government. So a little bit nicer, a little bit nearer by, a little bit, you know. I'm not saying that NGOs don't support. And in fact, the best NGOs are those, really the best NGOs are those who keep the people's movement autonomous, democratic, uh, self-organized, and they support it. They support it by maybe some kind of technical inputs or legal inputs or, you know, uh, but they allow the people's movement to develop as it is, you know, and they don't take out the best elements from that and put them in the NGO agenda. Because then the, the, the leaders who are created with great difficulty from amongst the people are lost again. It's like, you know, you keep on skimming the milk every time the malai comes. That's not good. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, and, and in today's time for the very marginalized who cannot organize. Actually, they can't do without NGOs. NGOs are now the, the alternative to the government. As I said, they are the ones who, through which all government schemes are rooted, all government relief is rooted, everything. You know, in labor, for example, you know, when people started walking, the government suddenly discovered that it actually needed the NGOs. It needed, you know, Labor Line or Ajivika or, you know, it needed all those uh, uh, NGOs to just document what is happening, to give help, to give relief and so on, because you have been crushing the unions which could have done it. You have been crushing unions. You are not allowing unions to function. But those NGOs can only extend some government relief. They can't organize people. And they will not be allowed to organize people. The day they organize, their FCRE will go. <laughs> they will not be permitted to do it. And you, you're seeing that. You're seeing that. Every NGO which has even dared to have an opinion or dared, dared to even slightly, let us say, support a movement against Adani or support a movement against some other corporate, unka uh, FCRE So, you know, then the other thing which happens is we don't rely on the people anymore. No, there was a time when there were only people's movements and I, for example, I've never been, uh, I've always been supported by my union. The first time I took up a job was at the age of 57, 58 when I joined the National Law University. Till then I never had any job. I was throughout supported by my union. So, but that, and of course now organizations are very weak. Uh, when 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 workers don't have any salary, how can they support anybody else? How can they have connections? How can they have? There was a time when they were, and there were huge trade union offices, and there were you know people were doing solidarity, people were supporting others. Uh, CMSs itself supported Rajnandgaon workers, Bilai workers, workers from everywhere. So, so I don't know whether I have answered your question. Uh, I got the answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, we can move to Shri's question. Shri, please unmute yourself. Comrade, are you there? No, there are others also you can just ask. Yes. Um. So I think we can go with Hindol's question. Hindol, can you unmute yourself and let us know your question? Yeah. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can I see you as well, please? <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll try. Nice to see you. Unless you're not in a condition to be seen. <laughs> it says, it, no, no. It says you cannot start your video because the host okay, stopped okay. it. Fine, fine. Carry so, on. Sorry. Yeah. yeah uh, actually, it was uh, such a wonderful feeling to 
finally get to hear you and like see you in person because we have been struggling to, for the release of all the prisoners for the last two three years now. Uh, in I I am I live in Jadavpur uh, in Kolkata. Uh, I study in Jadavpur University. Uh, actually, like today there were two meetings. Like uh, right now, as you are, uh, you were giving this talk. Doctor Tel Tumble was on another Zoom meeting giving a yeah, talk. Yeah, I, I I wanted to attend that as well. I'm so sorry that I missed it. Uh, but I also didn't know about <laughs> it till today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like it's it's like after such a long time, it's a it's such yeah. a great. Thing. But you're going to get another chance. Uh, I think there's going to be a discussion on Manoj Mitta's book in which uh, Ananji again is going to be speaking. So maybe I'll get. Okay, okay. Like we'll surely be looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, Sudhaji, I had some questions. Uh, we have been organizing, like in our university, uh, we have been organizing our workers, uh, the contractual workers of the university for the last one year. Actually, tomorrow is the. Uh, conference, the first yearly conference of the workers' union. Uh, from that experience, what we got to learn is that, like, the right now the contractual workers, the Jadav University contractual workers' union that is there, is pretty strong. It's like it has three fifty out of three seventy employees are uh, registered with our union. Oh. But in the beginning, wow. uh, mm. in the beginning, it was very difficult because all of them were extremely scared of losing their jobs. Uh, the students union in jadav university like it has a jadav university has a strong history it has a big history of yes yes i'm aware of that yeah so the student unions came to support the contractual worker union and in the first phases in the during the first couple of months of last year uh, the movement was essentially carried out jointly by the students and the workers uh, we can also see this same uh, principle almost Applied to Punjab, where the contractual worker unions Correct. platform uh, get support from the peasantry, the BKU Ugrahan and the other. Kisan Correct. Unions. Correct. Correct. So yes. My first question was like, uh, do we need to look at the concept of United Front in a different way than it is normally viewed? Like, I think normally it's viewed pretty mechanically, uh, as in like we'll first build unions and then we'll unite them together in a united front yeah, uh, yeah. From, from considering the present uh, perilous situation of the yes. workers um, yes do we need to build a strong support outside the factory first maybe maybe maybe, maybe can... you're right and in fact uh, uh, that umbrella you know under which you know this can the grow and and flourish is uh, yes I, I i i think so and i think you see that is why uh, though uh, you know theoretical understanding is very important one should not be a you know stickler one should also see practically what is happening and what experiments are succeeding and what experiments are failing and i think we need to uh, and particularly you see students are a different category altogether <laughs> in, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, though they belong to, uh, they, they, they are a privileged, uh, nowadays they, they are a privileged, uh, come from privileged sections of the society, but they have not yet been absorbed into the ideology of the system, uh, or or at least they, they don't, uh, they, they still have some freedoms in that. But, but they uh, give a very, and I'm seeing exactly the same thing here in IIT Bombay, where we are doing some cases of the graduity, and uh, accidents, etc., of contract workers on the sites here. So I've been involved in that, and again, I'm seeing that it's because the the students or the faculty. The same story is there in IIT Kanpur. The same story is there. In, so many of the educational institutions, and uh, actually, when we were in JNU, I, I told you that that was exactly what we were trying to do in JNU and Ames when we were. You know, I lived in JNU and my. Uh, Ames studied at Ames, and we were going to this work with a group of students. So, yeah, I think, um, but uh, we need to. Uh, it's a very delicate relationship, in the sense that uh, we should be there to strengthen and nurture that organization. Uh, we should not take it over. Not lead it ourselves. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, uh, uh, sometimes we need to uh, this thing. I mean, I don't know. But like, I, I just said it's a very delicate relationship. 
in the sense of sometimes um, so uh, there has to be you know the 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 leadership which uh, naturally emerges from there has to be encouraged and integrated so uh, uh, it's exactly. a, it, but it's a, it has to be a very democratic process a genuinely democratic process not a uh, you know uh, because you see one thing we must remember we, we have a committee okay let's say we have a committee and some students are there some workers are there now we often think that we are all sitting equally sab zameen pe baithe hain sab bade purane kapde pehne hain kisi ne bhi chai nahi pi hai so you know it's all equal it is not all equal our levels of articulation our level of being able to convince our you know uh, 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 resources that we have in our mind of history and politics and news and general knowledge and all that we are going to use it when we argue okay they actually have another resource which we we were not privy to which is really the the actual story of the production the places they come from the real class struggle which is being waged there the conditions of their class which we are not privy to actually we don't know anything about they know it much better but how do we really make that committee meeting really equal it's a challenge we must never stop thinking about and for that i think some trouble has to be taken to like suppose there's a committee of 10 people you have to take trouble to interact you know with each person to make sure that they can all speak up and they they can all raise their issues nobody is silent because they are hesitant and, and that is so it's really teaching democracy how in an organization do you really have democracy i think that's a big challenge yes i mean i i'm and sorry i, I, had, I deviated I had from your question two other two other questions like very small questions like one of them is like um do you think that uh, sectarian trade unions like only uh, forming trade unions under one specific uh, central trade union and hello uh, sorry for interrupting but can we please move on to the next question uh, actually we are almost at around 8 pm okay sure 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 not a you can of course uh... um uh, any one of you uh, who wants to interact later please is more than welcome uh... just message me and then we can maybe talk later introduce yourself message me and can talk uh, hello yes um hindol can you can you can do the yes, same sir. i think we'll move okay. on to the next question okay uh, mukundan uh, would you unmute yourself and raise your question actually devjani i was wait, i am i'm waiting yes, since uh, 25 minutes actually yes yes sachin please ask your question sorry about yeah. uh hello ma'am uh, myself sachin i am also from i am a alumni actually from azim prem university and we were also engaging in the uh, different activities at the campus uh, and we had a student labor uh, unions uh, programs there also but right now i am outside and i am like doing some research work in my area which is very backward that is maratwada region so i wanted to uh, ask you about uh so leader so developing leadership from the people itself especially in the uh, backward region what should we uh, you know uh, understand better uh, particular region and then develop the leadership in that particular area uh actually it, it you know i think I, you you uh, you know nothing is more educative than trying out something you know to it's very difficult to come at some theoretical conclusion about this and anyway i i am sorry i have not ever done any organizing in rural area and i i do not know maratwada region so i'll really not be able to speak very confidently about that um i think we uh, as a as a uh, very conscious social scientist when you are going about you have to be aware of all the various factors uh, the caste dynamics the the uh, the the class dynamics the caste dynamics among the people whom you are working what is happening and all that but you also have to see that you see for example in any organization in any uh, 
trade union, when we first start a trade union, for example, the first set of leaders who comes are usually those who are in quotes the natural leaders. You know, they will be maybe the more upper caste one, the more educated one, or the more you know vocal people, or the more aggressive people. I remember in Chhattisgarh many times the first people to come to us would be people who are from Bihar and UP, who are more you know <laughs> uh, vocal about their this thing as compared to the Chhattisgarhia people who used to be. So sometimes you have to work with one layer before. You know, then either that layer gets scared or bought off, or you know they get corrupted or whatever. And then another layer. It's like peeling an onion. It's like peeling an onion before. Uh, so, but you see, you have to go through that process. You can't say, "Arey, ye log to aise hain, to I'll not work with them." You see what I mean? Yeah. So initially, when you go. People themselves put forward certain people as their leaders. नहीं नहीं आप बोलिए भैया आप बोलिए you know that is because but you know you have to create processes where you get other people also to participate and you also uh, get to know what maybe are what are the the failings of that people who are coming up for leadership or there are some grouses against those people and one of the best ways to do it is to be very frank about yourself and to say look look I mean uh, I also realize I also make mistakes. You know, a self criticality के साथ आप उसमें interact करिए and even criticize your uh, friends. Uh, I'm saying that you encourage spirit where you are actually able to get to know those people better and maybe other kind of leaders will come up over time. But you have to give that process time. You have to people take a long time to trust and for Very good reason. Why should they trust anybody like us? Why should they trust anybody like us? They have been betrayed by us hundred times over. So, uh, I think we need to, uh, you know, not feel uh, this. We we have to have equal patience and consider this a process. You are also learning. They are also learning. We are all learning together yeah. about it. So. I'm afraid I can't say anything more specific. I don't know much about that no, region where you're working. But I, I, I mean, uh, so you talk about this peeling an onion and you know process se jana hai. That is more important for me right now. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, I would like to connect with you. Uh, in coming time also. Would you sure, like to sure. share your? Uh, at the end, I think uh, what Devjani can do is to give my uh, WhatsApp number and my uh, email ID. and uh, i would encourage you to first slightly introduce yourselves uh, actually mail is preferable because i have disappearing messages so the messages disappear many times so maybe you can just drop me a mail and then we can decide how to take forward any conversation that you'd like to do thank you so much yeah okay comrades i'll leave my mail id in the chat box somewhere you can find me you can drop me a mail and i'll send uh sudha comrades uh, contact number mail id to you guys um okay we'll have to wrap it up a little quick because we have already uh, <laughs> we are at exceeded uh, our time <laughs> yes exceeded our time and we are running um, a little late uh, so uh, shri um, dhuni kavya and mukundan uh, just um, uh, i would i request you to uh, wrap your questions up fa- first uh, fast um, shri uh, could you could you put put in your question yeah hi comrade uh, am i audible uh, yeah yeah so uh, my question is regarding the crisis of migrant you mentioned the covid 19 crisis and the uh, lacks of people who had to go back to the villages during the crisis so uh, two questions first uh, how does the trade union movement deal with the migrant labor crisis particularly who are coming from a more peasant consciousness and a more peasant background who are still not uh, who still don't have the consciousness of getting unionized uh, who are also going to move in maybe a 6 month to an year long period how does the trade union movement deal with this instability of migrant labor and how do they deal with their issues how do they organize them uh, secondly how does a trade union a revolutionary trade union which wants to build a peasant worker alliance in the long term how does it deal with the antagonism which is growing and which is being fostered by fascism in the present against migrant labor the idea that these are the people who are coming from outside and uh, stealing our opportunities and our limited resources especially with the 
crisis that is emerging and peasantry's impoverishment is continuing to increase okay um uh, yeah so i'll try to answer that um see the first question about organizing migrant labor actually we have uh, we are pretty bad at it there are some people who are trying now the problem with migration is you see uh, many times the migration happens from areas which are drought prone where manrega wages are deliberately suppressed for months together so there there are people for example organizing on the uh, on the side where migration is taking place maybe by trying to get them manrega wages and all that you know and, and that is the source from where the migration begins so because people are so impoverished then they take take advances from contractors and then they go to the destination place then there are people who are organizing the destination okay in fact i found a very interesting uh, young person who who actually was not an organizer or anything he was actually doing it for his living there was an ayurvedic doctor uh, young man who actually used to travel along with the migrant workers uh, from bilaspur to uh, somewhere in gujarat and they took him along with them to treat their families can you imagine i mean that was the way he sustained his own living and he uh, so uh, you know we but really the trade union movement has not uh, i mean i know that there are people who are trying to organize on both ends really i think uh, i mean i myself cannot off the cuff tell you many experiences of this nature that kya karna chahiye iske liye and of course the interstate migrant workmen act is an act which is not even matlab uska abcd bhi kahi implement nahi hota it's just there on the paper so uh, and if it was actually applied there would be no migration at all so um Which, which side we can organize them, or do we need to organize them on both sides, or how do we do it? Yeah, sir. Uh, it really, uh, I don't know. It's going to take many, many years of very steady work to uh, do this. And now the migration is huge. Like I mean, people from Chhattisgarh people go to Kashmir, they go to Chennai, they go to uh, you know Porbandar, they go to Bhopal, they go to they go all over the place, and. Um, uh, you know i i they, there's just um, and we saw that we saw the crisis which happened when they all tried to come back and all tried to go back and all that um so i really have nothing to offer except that some people have to very dedicatedly work either at the place where the migration happens or at the destination point and preferably the two those two groups should be in connection with each other and then we try to find some ways of uh but uh, it's very difficult organizing they are usually the real underbelly they are the underbelly where they go and they underbelly from where they come you know so they often get bonded and you know then uh, all that so i really have nothing to offer you uh, on those i i personally also have not been much working except in some cases of rescuing of bonded labor i've done some work but i've been mostly still in organized industry so I, the second question which you said about uh, the the antagonism between uh, farmers and workers see this is what i was talking about contradictions among the people they become antagonistic if you are refusing to see all other contradictions and precisely like in the farmers movement when they saw the larger contradiction and they could spot that larger contradiction very clearly then it was easier to say okay these rest of them are the contradictions between the people and let's try to solve them but the problem is if you don't focus on that larger contradiction at all then this becomes it, it's like the the women who fight at the uh, tap you be nobody is going to say let's uh, take a morcha to the municipal corporation and ask them to give uh, two more hours of water they will hit each other matlab ki we i will fill first and you will fill first because that is the easy thing that is the visible thing and then on top of that if you've got a very divisive political uh, thing which is you know anti migrant or anti 
particular place or anti particular religion or anti particular caste or anti particular region you know what they did try to do in tamil nadu that you know bihari workers are being treated like this or you know uh, odia workers are thrown out of somewhere or in maharashtra when during the textile strike it was it was as an antidote to the to the datta saman struggle that the shiv sena started and the shiv sena started attacking bhaiyas the 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 up people and the people from bihar now these are all the easy ways out uh, for those organizations who usually have an agenda but if you are sincerely working on both sides like we have actually uh, uh, had many examples like uh, in baloda bazar we were, we were working with the workers inside the cement industry we were also working with the villagers against the effluents of the cement so it looks like a contradiction but actually the people from the village were also working in the plant and sometimes the, the management tries to pit these two groups against each other but we could work on both sides and on the contrary we managed to get the management to you know uh, give permanent jobs to people who had lost their land and also to mitigate the effluents and all that um, so yeah it needs a lot of working on both the sides the the problem is often we have organization only on one so either we are organizing the farmers and then for us those people who go to that plant let's say we are organizing against the power plant then then some people will be brought from outside to work in that plant so they became our dushman okay uh, suppose we are on that side and and uh, the the villagers attack the power plant then for those guys so we need to have a much better understanding of where we are placed and i think in that the fundamental thing is to be with the group which is willing to organize all of the groups you know uh not the group which is just looking up out for itself and i'll give you an example that during the posco struggle the initial group of villagers which fought against posco there was another group of villagers who supported the company and in fact there were uh, huge clashes between them and all that but actually when the company went to uh take the land away from them those people wanted to come and join this first group then some people in the leadership in the first group said why should we take them they have been doing so many things they filed fires against us they took lati danda and they fought with us that was when the leadership had to step in and say look but basically they are, belong to the same class as we are maybe some leaders misguided them maybe some people misguided them but we we need to unite because actually these are our allies so there you require a remarkably mature political leadership to do all these things and uh, it's a tough thing but yeah <laughs> it uh... Okay, Mukundan, can we um, have a question now? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question was that uh, as fascism is sharpening in India, we can see that uh, the petty bourgeois is refusing to uh, organize itself. Like it, it, it has the tendency to protect its own class character. So as petty bourgeois, like we can't when we are facing difficulties in organizing ourselves. Uh, petty bourgeois students um um uh, how how can we uh, integrate ourselves and uh, be part of revolutionary workers movement because it is a proletariat which is at the end of the day that is the uh, proletariat and the pe peasantry uh, which is at the end of the day going to lead the uh, revolutionary struggle uh, within india so how do we integrate ourselves within the proletariat and peasantry so that uh, we can move the Uh, revolution forward see mukundan a very as as i told you earlier it's a very small section of this which is going to switch sides and go to that side okay rest of the as you said the middle class wo uh, there's a saying in hindi i don't know how to say it in english jidhar bam udhar hum you know when once they start see the balance of class forces changing the middle class will change its color it will decide who it is with okay whether it's on this side or this side it's always on the side of the winner 
but it is only a handful of people who anyway get get involved in uh, with with other classes so i think really here analyzing the entire class i mean doesn't really help because for example i i studied in iit kan i think in my batch i mean barring a handful of people almost everybody went abroad few people continued or they came back Uh, and then uh, became in top management and all that. I think I was the only one who, <laughs> in my my one of the few, maybe two, three of us who uh, who th even thought of throwing their lot in with some other class. I think we are going to be like that, and uh, so I don't think we can try to uh, influence that. uh that class where we have come from often that class hates us much more because they think that we have betrayed their class <laughs> so we uh, we have betrayed our origins by switching over to the other class um so yeah i really can't uh, enlighten you further on this problem <laughs> Okay, um, Duni, could you state your questions? And after Duni, we we would uh, uh, invite Arachika and Comrade Clifton to state. Uh, oh, Clifton state. is here. Hello, Clifton. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Hi, I've been listening. Hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I was going to tell you this is a waste of time for you. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah. This is Yeah. Never a waste of time. So that <laughs> I I have a few comments. I I'll say. It. So let Dhuni first. Yeah. Ah, uh, she will ask the question. We are from IIT Kanpur. Hi. <laughs> Join the gang. <laughs> Not in jail, but. Huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I I have a very basic yeah. question. I don't know, but um, in UP especially. the caste comes first caste consciousness basically comes first and sometimes people are not aware of their class conscious class about their classes how are an organized or unorganized sectors um, unions basically move from uh, caste consciousness to class consciousness very difficult question uh see the thing is that i uh in fact that is one of the shortcomings of my experience and my work also that uh, because we worked in uh, areas where there were more adivasis around us so i really do not have the kind of experience of such sharp caste divisions as you would be having if you're working let's say in the tannery industry or with the uh, uh, sweepers or with the uh, uh, you know we have now started learning this as we are working with the um with the uh, safai karmacharis in the uh, durg district in the various municipal councils and corporations we are understanding that um you see in the engineering industries for example where we worked it was mostly middle caste mostly obcs and there was a very small smattering only of uh sc or st it's mostly it will be the middle castes who who come in to do the uh, engineer in the engineering industries most of so it really the exposure uh, uh, so i think we need to work this out in very specific ways when we organize around certain demands i think naturally in a union people do organize around certain demands and that is a class organization but to make uh, to to make people aware about how they are discriminating even within that or how certain kinds of work are being done by you know are uh, are uh, caste bound or how we are not allowing representatives from that community to be part of the union leadership ये सारी चीजें आई थिंक इन अ वेरी कॉन्शियस वे द लीडरशिप विल हैव टू एंगेज इन डिस्कशन अबाउट दिस 
uh, I mean, I, I uh, not so much with the case of caste, but with the case of women, definitely we can see when Nyogi did it to some extent when he involved women in the uh, anti liquor movement and 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 because they were equal in production. They were almost the same number of women as they were men. So that was a great advantage. Uh, later on, when we shifted to the distillery industries and uh, again, but we had to put up a fight for the women to be in the leadership of the, uh, of the union. It is there. And for a long time, the union doesn't take up the issues of uh, domestic violence or sexual harassment, etc. And sometimes, um, uh, like, for example, when there are allegations against a male leader of the union, it's a very difficult thing. It's not an easy thing to actually work out, you know. So uh, then one, the, the union has to use its, uh, its uh, trust uh, with the people to uh, bring out that issue and to actually uh, discipline that, that uh, male worker or male leader maybe who is behaving in ways which uh, we think are wrong, maybe with his wife or maybe with other women or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, uh, so practically we have faced those kind of situations. The the caste situation we have not really faced either so much uh, this thing, but uh, we are now when uh, in organizing the sweepers, which is which has happened since I went to JD. So I really uh, don't know so much about it. Um, but yeah, I think I would imagine it would be much the same that we have to uh, the discrimination at work the uh, allowing them to be part of the leadership, uh, inclu including them in the leadership, raising those issues. Uh, the the leaders, the, wh whoever's leading the union has to be very conscious about this, you know, whether it is with relation to caste or with relation to gender. Yeah. Thank you. Thank much. you, ma'am. Um, Comrade Clifton, would you now take over? Before you uh, begin, I'd just like to introduce Comrade Clifton to everyone. Um, Comrade Clifton is an advocate and he is also the National Secretary of AICCTU. He has also been uh, advocating for civil rights and liberties and um, um, union among the working class for many, many years. Thank you, Dejan. Actually, thank you. Uh, firstly, I really have to commend uh, Spark for the phenomenal work that they've been doing actually so that they've really uh, this magazine that they've come out with is uh, is quite uh, interesting it's uh, they, and they do it on the dot every month and they take these magazines and they every issue there's a bunch of them who go to all these colleges stand there and actually sell each issue you know so the kind of work that they're doing is really quite inspiring for at least somebody you know like me and uh, i was so happy when i heard that uh, they've invited you for this uh, talk and just for everyone, you know, I mean, Sudha is really an inspiration to all of us who've been part of the movement. And of course, uh, uh, Shankar uh, uh, Niyogi is somebody who uh, many of us, you know, maybe I'm just a small half generation after uh, Sudha. But I remember when we were in Narmada Bacha Vandalan, this, uh, the question of Sangarsh or Narnirman, you know, always struggle and building an alternative. Of course, the, the, uh, uh, they can never be the uh, the you know the impetus of providing the alternative on people who are struggling. It just becomes uh, it becomes part of the struggle in that sense. So I remember exactly. with my with great difficulty, I've actually read that book on. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? With I mean, it's I've struggled. So if you I are know, actually going to so unfair to the South Indians, yes. <laughs> if you are translating it, please please do translate it. I I recommend that book to everyone over here. Uh, in terms of you know a kind of a uh, an organizing of the working class which is far more emancipatory which has a which has a broad vision you know and actually uh, when you talk of revolution when you talk of change how do you see it on an everyday basis and you internalize it in the on the everyday basis that is something that you know yeah, that, yeah. that 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 worked really so thank you uh, thanks a lot for the for that uh, sudha I just wanted to, you know, just uh, share with you the uh, all the things that you've said. I mean, it's really, uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to you because, uh, you know, a lot of the problems that you, that we face on an everyday basis in terms of organizing, 
it's just nice to hear somebody reflect on it so so deeply so i'm most grateful to you for that uh, this question of actually contract labor you know that is something that uh, that really uh, troubles uh, you know it's troubling uh, the entire working class today it's become a malaise in that sense and with the codes that are going to come into force it basically institution institutionalizes uh, uh, contract labor so i was just you know uh, thinking uh, i just wanted uh, your thoughts a, a bit on this uh, you really need a, like we've been working primarily with contract workers here and in fact one of the questions on this caste and class question for us you know the uh, one of the biggest organizing we've done is with safai karmacharis where mm -hmm. primarily it is the class caste and gender question all and three gender. of them yes in, all three together. it's it's in that kind of triple operation that uh, that you know the workers have to overcome and then you see you know workers actually then taking up positions of leadership of responsibility of driving that really you know gives you kind of hope but i think uh, you know the the broad question that i really uh, had for you was um, on this contract labor i also read uh, much of what you've written on this uh, uh, but you know i think in terms of for the for the for our, for our comrades over here uh, your students you know actually many of them who are working along with uh, working class struggles i know at least from the from the group in bangalore over here there's a large number of them who are part of a lot of the uh, struggles that happen in in bangalore over here of the working class so i think in terms of you know some kind of uh, uh, some kind of um, uh, leads in terms of how they can actually uh, you know participate much more in the working class struggles this integrating with the masses what you spoke about is one aspect but i think also this this ye jo matlab kanun ka daav preach hai in this ah, yeah yeah so if you can just just lightly talk about that and uh, before i end i just wanted to tell everyone that sudha's book is just out uh, it's called uh, from fansi yaad uh, i have actually ordered a copy of it and i'm actually hoping that uh, i i've just got six copies today unfortunately yes, yes. only six yaad i am asking them for more <laughs> yeah so i really uh, uh, recommend to everyone to please uh, you, you know uh, get a copy of this book so that's been an inspiration to uh, most of us i'll end with just this uh, thing when i when i went to meet her in raipur few years ago before she just got arrested i don't know if she remembers but um, it was on that first floor of yours yeah 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 there was a bunch of adivasis who had come there and i remember that they brought some food grains and i think they paid uh, sudha for the matters that she was doing in food grains and in that sense you know i think even when we talk about the legal profession and uh, it, you can very easily you know uh, uh, get you know your your harish salves and your kapil sibils and all of them but i think it's you know uh, people like sudha who really uh, taken up the daunting task of representing underprivileged sections the oppressed sections rather in court and you know it's really I'm so happy that I I got to listen to you, and I'm I'm most grateful to Spark for having organized Certainly. this. Certainly, I mean it's a remarkable thing, and they had so many participants. I'm very surprised, but <laughs> pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. So what do I say about that? Actually, um, Clifton himself, I think, would really be uh, the proper person to answer that. But uh, yeah, as a lawyer. Uh, um see uh, as i said i mean i think amplifying the voice of these people who are struggling against all odds uh, in whatever we can in our professional capacities uh, one is of course to be with them and to integrate oneself with them and uh, work in their organizations the other is as a, as professional so as a journalist as a lawyer uh, how how do we help and um you know there are some things which i learned as a lawyer first of all i i became a lawyer at the age of 40 and 61 now so i be, I, i didn't choose to be a lawyer but the, the workers made me a lawyer and that was because actually uh, uh, i would go with them to brief the lawyers and then so many times we've had briefs thrown at us because we couldn't pay the fees <laughs> so then the workers said ki didi waise bhi aap itna mehnat karte ho you study such a lot you brief them also and on top of that why don't you just become a Uh, a lawyer so in fact when i adopted my daughter those, those three years i spent uh, i'm very i have to shamefully admit that i only read kunji is to pass i uh, did not attend many classes so i did but the important thing is not that the important thing is that to be a people's lawyer i mean how are we different from the other lawyers 
the first thing is that uh, we don't rush to court right so we uh, uh, we we have to understand that walking on two legs the the sadak kaladai and the court kaladai so whatever we do we should not close the door for organization and agitation and movement because the first thing when you go to a court what the court says is okay but they lift this dharna okay but you know you can't go on strike you know and that is the only weapon we have so how as a lawyer do we protect that and we should never impose uh, on that organization uh, those uh, those um, restrictions so we have to we have to use law in a very strategic way and i remember one comrade so beautifully he put it i don't know whether you are what what you call it in kannada the, uh, there is this game of kabaddi na where you have you, you go to the other side they he, they used to say that you know court uh, uh, the sport is actually the practice sport and you know we have to play kabaddi we should go and touch it and come back but we shouldn't get stuck over there so <laughs> you know that is the spirit in which we are i mean nelson mandela used to say i am a black man in a white man's court maybe we you are a, you are a, you are a dalit in a servant court or you are a woman in a man's court and you are also a worker in a capitalist court it is their court remember so how do we still get something for our people how do we protect what we have got how do we make sure that we don't uh, in any way uh, harm the organization and for that we have to listen very carefully to people because you know in the case of workers uh one thing that i realized in the case of contract workers they hardly have any documents they don't have any documents most of the time and it is on the basis of literally no documents that sometimes so but if you talk with them if you're close with them if, if they trust you then they will themselves tell you uh, they will create that evidence they will say yeah you know but one person from our group he had an accident he died he was given a compensation okay so that forms a proof Uh, an evidence that they were working in that department so that becomes evidence for the court so it is your closeness with the people which is going to allow you to win that case so listen to people and the problem is that the, as lawyers we have to appreciate the, the distance between law and justice you know i i i, I so closely remember that there was one group of uh, um, uh, people who had come and they were talking about the land acquisition so they had this long winded story and then did this happened and this happened and this happened and they must have been uh, you know seeing that i have a very sad face but i am not reacting very much because you know the problem is all this is legal whatever is happening with them is legal and then i asked him acha uh, did they give you a notice so then they said no and then i am also cheered up oh great so they didn't give you a notice so you know now for people whether a notice was given or not it's still unjust but for us legally if a notice was not given then it becomes illegal so we have to you know so it is our job that whatever is the injustice done to them we have to find a remedy in the law how do we do that it's a big challenge because the law is really not really for them it has never been for them we have to carve out exceptions for them and and sometimes the law has been extremely unjust and it's going to get more unjust i don't know what is going to happen after these four courts and fixed term contract and all that business so um, so our job is how do we frame justice in terms of law and we really have to work hard at it and uh, and when we say work hard sometimes what happens is when we are with people we think oh i'm working i'm with people and all that and that is enough no you have to you have to work you have to face those corporate guys on the other side who have all the facilities they have all the juniors they have all the computer they have all sec online and they have everything and you still have to come up to the same level of competence on behalf of the people on behalf of the people you have to really so it is really an uphill task but let me tell you it's very much worth it it's very much worth it and whatever we do it's for the people we are on the people side the main thing is to choose to be on the people side so all of all those of you who are thinking of going into this very uh, disparaging <laughs> this this what to say uh, this field called labor law in which nobody ever wins any cases please continue to do so we need it we 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 uh, you know we need to be to fight and to uh, talk about justice uh, continue to talk about justice in whichever way we can
thank you thank you so much okay um before we close i now call upon comrade aratrika to deliver a message and then we will please oh, thanks to uh, uh, sudha ma'am for sparing almost 3 hours of her time for us uh, thanks to comrade shilakshmi devjani and comrade clifton for uh, their valuable <laughs> inputs as well as for the moderating efforts so lastly thanks from the entire squad team to sudha ma'am uh, for the participants in the call if you want to uh, procure the hard copies of the october issue please uh, mail to us at spark_karnataka@protonmail.com we'll post the copies to you we'll continue to uh, host such kind of webinars in future as well so we'll keep you updated uh, thanks again inkalab zindabad bilkul inkalab zindabad and uh, all the best to the spark team please continue to this spark and let us hope that these sparks make many more sparks thank you <laughs> thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am ma good night comrades okay. thanks a lot thanks everyone bye bye so that take care bye bye take care you too thank, thank you thank you so much thank you so much